by way of review for those who weren't here last week, we've been walking as a church through Deuteronomy this year, going through the Shema. And in fact, we've taken that prayer and we've kind of made that our own. And so let's recite that now. Hear, O Bedford, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you will love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your strength. Right, so that's where we've been at. God has brought us back to a place of reconnecting with him and giving him everything that we have. We broke up that scripture and we were looking at each of those words and the first word there here is, there's many facets to that, but as we discovered the word here means to, in that context to respond with obedience to what God had been commanding. And so um, I spoke last week briefly that uh, a few months ago we went to Pennsylvania to the Sights and Sounds Theater with my mother and father-in-law for their 50th anniversary. And while we were on the way back, I was listening to a book by Robert Morris called Frequency, Tune In and Hear God. And it was such an impactful thing to me that I thought this, we really need to do a sermon on this. We've been talking about hearing from God. We've taken a look at the Shema, why we do it, how to do it, what uh, the benefits of that are. And now we're going to talk about what does it mean, though, for us in our current day to hear from God. How do we hear from God? And so last week, the first thing that we looked at was we looked at our ability to hear God, and we used the analogy of a child. And we said that the ability to hear God was three things. Number one, it's innate. So we are born with the ability to hear God. You think of children, when they're born in the womb, they come out of the womb, they have the ability to hear and to speak. Now when they're infants, they, they don't really communicate much uh, in the way of words, right? But, but they have that capability, uh, unless there's some kind of defect. Um, but we have the ability to hear and speak. Then we said the ability to hear God is learned. And we talked about how um, not everything that we hear is from the Lord. And so we have to learn what to make those distinctions. What is God speaking? What is it? my thoughts? What are the influences of this? And we talked about how even like use, following that same analogy of children, that they learn to speak. They learn to form words, what to say, how to put sentences together, uh, things of that nature. And then maturity, the ability to hear God is matured. In the same way that children, we have to teach them, hey, no, don't say that. That's not an appropriate thing to say or something of that nature. We're also learning to hear from God. Like we said, not everything that we hear in our heart is necessarily from God. So today the title of the message is, I'm a friend. All right, so last week we were sheep, this week we're a friend. All right, so turn to the person next to you and say, I'm a friend. All right, and now God, we're going to find out that God has given us free will. So I'm going to give you the option to choose. You have one of two things. You can be positive or maybe not so positive. You can say, you still smell like a sheep, or you could say you smell much better this week. <laughs> Whichever you want to choose. <laughs> All right, so starting this off, we want to think of the analogy of two types of friends. Okay, let's say that you're in a hospital. Let's say Brad's in the hospital, and, and I'm going to go visit Brad. Which type of friend do you think he would prefer to have? Let's say I wrote a bunch of books and uh, I hear Brad is in the hospital, I go to the hospital, I go to the front desk, and I'm like, I drop him off at the front desk, and I say, hey, can you give these to Brad? I know he's in here. Uh, I just want to just wanna encourage him. Here's the books. And then I leave. Or the kind of friend that comes and says, hey, Brad, here's the books I have. I spend time with him before I go to work in the morning. I maybe text him throughout the day. In the evening, I go by, and I sit, and I talk with him. Which type of friend do you think he would prefer? It's okay, you can question. Yeah, the second one, the one who wants to spend time, to sit and spend time. Now, sometimes we're busy and, and we have to do things like that, but uh, if you're the second kind of friend, you're still going to follow up with the text message or try to get over there and encourage him, right? How many of you have ever done this? Or here's one, have you ever snuck food into a hospital for somebody, one of your friends? That, that, that you know, can be a really uh, source of encouragement, or you could also get in trouble uh, for that. But, 
but that might speak to the level of your friendship. Like, what are you willing to do to show your love for your friend, right? Well, God wants to be the kind of friend to us that sits and talks with us, not just drop off the books, his Bible, for us to read alone. He wants to sit and talk to us. And that's not minimizing the word of God, but uh, stating that that's not the extent of his relationship to us. God speaks to us in many ways. And what we looked at last week is we need to learn that as we're learning how his voice, we need to align it with the word and make sure that it lines up with the word of God to know that, yes, this is the word of God or not. But he doesn't want us to just read the books he's written. He wants to sit and talk with us. So let's turn to John 15, 15. Brad, once again, pulls up a verse. Uh, I don't know if you knew we were going to be talking about that particular one, but this is one of the texts. If you want to you know, put your finger in one place, we're going to read John 15, verse 15 briefly, and then we're going to turn to Genesis 18. And that's where the bulk of, of things will be, the second part of this. But John 15, 15. All right, Sophie, if you want to pull that one up on the screen there. It says, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you what? Say it with me. Friends, for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now the words there for made known comes from the Greek word gnosko. It means to know, to declare, to certify. So, he no longer uh, calls us slaves, but as friends. He talks with us. So why does God speak to us? Because we're his friends. So this morning we're going to look at three things about God speaking to us. All right, Three things about God speaking to us. The first thing is God doesn't speak to us like robots. Now, that seems like a weird statement maybe, but think about it. God has given us free will. right? Why has he given us free will? because he's a God that wants relationship, right? He could have just hardwired us so that all we would do is just be obedient to whatever he says, right? But that's not how he wired us, because he wants relationship. He wants us to choose him. So when you think about the two, t there's possibly, for this context, two types of communication that we have here on earth. When you think of mechanical, communication, that's how we interact with machines, or personal communication, how we interact with people. Now we interact mechanically all the time. Think of a car, right? Now you're not talking to the car, right? Although maybe that's coming, I don't know. Or if you're frustrated, you might say something, but we turn the key, we step on the gas, we step on the brake, we're telling the car to go, to stop, all those things. And we know cars nowadays are more advanced than they used to be. They have computer chips in them, so they're programmed, what? To get an input and produce a result. In the same way, computers are the same thing. I deal with that every day, computer programmer. I'm writing instructions for a program that when people do certain things, it, it responds a certain way. But, let me ask you this, have you ever talked to cars in a way that is personal? What about your commutes to work? <laughs> what are you doing? You know, to the car in front of you. Now, I am, I confess, I am that way a lot with cars, especially driving on the interstate. Now, I'm gonna, I've given this public safety reminder before, we're gonna do it again. Uh, Zoe, or I'm um, Sophie, there is a, an image on there I want you to pull up. Some people don't understand this, so we're just going to cover this real quick. When driving on the highway, there is a slow lane and a fast lane. All right, the right lane is for passing, or for driving, the left lane is for passing, right? Down south, they do a really good job of posting this all over the place. They don't do a great job of following it, but they post it everywhere. Have you ever been on the highway? Oh man, this, every time going to Ann Arbor, two lanes, there is always somebody riding in the passing lane going the speed limit or slower than the speed limit. I know we're supposed to obey the law. Going slower than the speed limit, bottlenecking everything up. 
And what happens? Everybody gets behind him. And sometimes there's people flashing their lights. They're riding right up next to him. And some people just don't get it. Here's one thing I've observed. Both Michigan and Ohio drivers do this. But I will say, Michigan drivers are the worst. Why? Because at least Ohio drivers will eventually get over. <laughs> eventually, when there's a way for them to get over, they do. But Michigan drivers will just ride in that lane. And so what happens? You get to a point, you can't pass them, so what do you do? You move to the right, and you pass them on the right. And what is standard procedure for when you have to make that maneuver? You give them the look. You give them the look. Not the gesture, because we're believers, we don't do that, but we give them the look. Right, because they got to know, hey, you, you've been bottlenecking this lane for five miles, you know, at least ten minutes. we got somewhere to go. So I just think, Dean, the police could make a killing if they would enforce that law. The policeman's ball would be funded for years and years and years. Just an observation. So anyway, one time I was driving in Turkey, and in Turkey, there are no laws, they're just suggestions. And like literally, even lanes, if you could fit a car or a bike up there, you're doing it. And over there, it's like a lot of Europe, your lights don't go green, yellow, red, they do that, but they also go from red to yellow back to green. And the moment it turns yellow, cars are laying on horns and they're getting going, and I, and I have seen people, get out of their car, go up and swing at people on their bikes and all kinds of stuff just because it's just craziness over there. Well, one day, I'm ashamed to say I got caught up in this. We're pulling off the base and there's somebody just riding really slow. And I go around them and I give them a gesture, not the gesture, a gesture, you know, just like, what are you doing? And I looked over and it was my neighbor yeah, talk about some humble pie. And then I had, to, I had to meet with him later at a get together. He was, he was gracious, he let me know, you know, well, this is why I was doing it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be so impatient. Be careful, remember, some of us have those ichthuses on the back of your car, remember who we are, whoops, sorry. Um, Anyway, that's just a side note, your public safety announcement. But we're communicating constantly. And God does not want to communicate to us mechanically. He wants to speak to us personally. So said another way, I like this quote by Robert Morris, God is not trying to input data to get a desired result. He wants to be your friend. Last week, we talked about how God doesn't just want to provide us with direction in life. He wants to communicate with us because he loves us. This week, I want to point out that God doesn't just want to provide us with direction in life. He wants to communicate with us because he wants to be our friend. It's one of the most amazing truths of the Bible. We were singing about it in that song earlier. He wants to be our friend. He wants to talk to us. Think about that. The God of the universe created you specifically. That alone should speak to you that he cares enough to create you. The very fact that you are here demonstrates his love and his heart for you. Why is it so hard for us to grasp this idea that he is, wants to be our friend? Turn to Genesis 18, verse 17. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed? Will surely. It's, it's a done deal. It's confident. Remember, this is, this is after uh, God had made the Abrahamic covenant with Abraham. We talked about that several uh, weeks ago. Uh, and so this is in the aftermath of that. The context of this is... Um, God was meeting with some men and with Abraham, and he was telling them about what's to come with Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 19, this language ought to really hit your heart, because this is the kind of language we've been looking at in Deuteronomy this whole time. For I have chosen him so that, God chose Abraham so that, he came, may command his children and his household after him. Look, there's generations. There's generations of following 
and keeping the commands of the Lord, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Now some translations uh, will use the word has spoken to him. Either way, it's the same thing. The NASB uses about him because it's talking about a past conversation in which Abraham, God was speaking to Abraham. So either way that works, it is a personal communication and audible speaking to Abraham. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now. This, this verse could really mess with your theology. Um, and we're not going to cover that today, but we might come back to this, because this is really intriguing to me. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. It's almost like the Lord is saying, he hasn't seen it, but he's been getting reports. He's been hearing about it. So I'm going to go down and see for myself, is it really as bad as it is? It's interesting. Verse 22, then the men turned away. So the other men that were in the presence left from there and went towards Sodom. And while Abraham was still standing, or while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Verse 23, Abraham came near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Now let's just pause there for a minute. If you want to know how to hear God, here are two simple things that were just stated in this verse uh, that we see here. Number one, stop what you're doing. And number two, draw near to God. Get in his presence. It can be that simple. Sometimes it takes more than that, but you, you, sometimes we have to work at it. But just stop whatever we're doing, remove all distractions, get alone with him and just be in his presence and wait on the Lord. Picking up in verse 24, suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? I want to ask you a question here as we're getting ready to go on to verse 25. Have you ever tried to manipulate God? I would dare to say that we have all used manipulation at some point in our life. And we probably have all tried to manipulate God. Uh, God, if you do this thing, I'll never. I'll go to. I'll be a. I'll do that. Have you ever said things like that? Usually it's when we're in dire straits over something, right? We're feeling desperate. We'll call out to God, we'll do anything. God, just get me out of this. We don't want to be manipulators. And there's some people that are really good at it. But you, once you get to know people, you recognize that. And so it's not something that you fall for. You see through those things. <laughs> so we need to be careful about that. Uh, but anyway, verse 25, here it comes. Far be it from you to do such a thing to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So here, here's Abraham. Now whether you see this as manipulation or whether you just see this as, as a man who is negotiating with God, right, who is speaking to God, reminding him of who he is, who his name. We've seen this pattern before. God welcomes this. Think of Jacob. I see Jacob sitting on the front row. Not this Jacob, but the Jacob of the Bible who wrestled with God, and God blessed him. God wants us to wrestle, to grapple with him, to, to negotiate. Hey, God, remember, King Hezekiah was told he's to prepare his house, he's about to die. God, remember the things that I've done for you. God changes his mind. We can wrestle with God. We can talk to God. Now, when God says something, we need to let it go and be obedient to that. But, but we see many patterns in Scripture of people reminding God of things, negotiating with him. Do you think God really forgot? Or do you think God wants to engage with his people? Yeah. 
So the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on that account, on their account. And Abraham replied, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the 50 righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? Don't you love how they do math in the, in the Bible? Instead of just saying 45, we go 50 and less five and, uh, you know. All that kind of stuff. Do the math in your head. Hurry up. All right, 45. And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. He spoke to him yet again. Suppose 40 are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of the 40. Then he replied, oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak. Support, suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 20. Then he said, oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I will speak only this once more. <laughs> Suppose 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 10. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. <laughs> it's a funny conversation to think about when, do you think Abraham had the number 10 in mind from the very beginning? And he's a little worried to maybe go that low, so he starts off five and he's negotiating his way down. And God just is probably <laughs> chuckling to him, right? And maybe, he, maybe he's like ribbing Jesus or the angels later on. Did you see what he was doing? Did you see what he was doing? Far be it from you. you know, oh, I'm but dust and ashes. It reminds me of Job in a way, right? Except Abraham is, he, he is, there's a sense of humility that he's demonstrating there. And he's negotiating with God. Now I wonder if Abraham thought, surely there's going to be 10 there because of Lot and his family. All right, so three things. Make sure I didn't miss anything there, yeah. So three things about God speaking to us. One, he doesn't speak to us like robots. Two, he speaks to us as humans. Okay, pretty, pretty straightforward. God speaks to people. We just read an account of God speaking to Abraham, but there are many examples in the Old Testament and New Testament where God is speaking to people. Right? Isaac, Jacob. We talked about Jacob. Jacob even wrestled with God, so he got physical with him. Moses, David, Solomon. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, the disciples, or as like we, we know them today, the chosen. Um, sorry, nothing, nothing, okay. I thought for sure the McMunns would get a chuckle out of that. The chosen. Uh, Paul, Luke, even Cornelius, who was an unbeliever. Or maybe there's more. So we have a pretty consistent track record that God speaks to people. Now, um, Robert Morris asked a couple questions that I love because it underscores the point that we spoke about last week. God still speaks to us today. And here's what he asked. Why would we think that the indwelling Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, would speak less to people today than he spoke in the Bible? Why would we think that God would send his spirit to dwell within us and yet make him mute? John 16, 12 through 13 says, I have many more things to say. This is Jesus speaking. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not, what? Speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will what? Speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. One of the biggest problems I think that we have is when we think about God speaking to people in the Bible is that we think that he talked to people in scriptures in an audible, booming voice. And it reminds me, years ago, there was a thing called cassette tapes. Anybody know what that is? You younger people don't know what that is. And this was high tech for us back then. I mean, there were, there were things before that 
that weren't as good. But I remember making bootleg copies <laughs> of cassette tapes because as a kid you were too poor to buy them. So my cousin made me my first Christian rock cassette of Petra, beat the system. And he even photocopied the jacket. Remember the jackets inside the cassette tapes? You fold out, you got the lyrics and maybe some footnotes about the band or whatever. And we would Xerox that thing at church and take some markers and color in and get it all looking just nice. And got an illegal copy of Petra, Beat the System. Ironically, they beat the system. Um, that's funny. That is actually funny because I did not pre-plan that. That was just there. So you know that was of the Lord. Uh, <laughs> but there, there were tapes called Maxell, right? They make CDs and all these things. They used to have an advertisement. Uh, Sophie, you want to bring up that picture now? And the speaker's blowing away and look at the lampshades tilted. You can't see it real well. There's a drink on this box next to him that's getting blown over. His scarf or tie is blown back. His hair is blown back. And I think sometimes when we see the stories, when we're reading the account of God in the Old Testament when he's speaking, we have kind of this image like, boom, God is speaking. But what if he spoke to people back then the way he speaks to you and I today? John 12, 28 through 30, there are times God does speak like thunder. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it thundered. Others were saying an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice was not, has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. At other times, we know that like with Elijah, it was a still small voice. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13 in the New King James Version says, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And before the Lord passed by, uh, behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it, he heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So there are times when God speaks in a booming voice, and there are times when he uses a still, small voice to speak to our heart. Last week, uh, there was something that I said, because uh, I was stressing one aspect of hearing. And so Carly, when we got home, she was kind of like, well, I, I think hearing from God is all of those things. Yes, 100%. We hear from God through the reading of his word. We hear through God through impressions. We hear through God from feelings. Sometimes people feel. And by the way, we might do a study on this. Uh, the women did a study on this a couple years ago. Your mom, Sonia, led this study. And it was about the different ways, the different types of people that we are and how we hear from God. Some people are knowers. Some people are feelers. Some people hear. And so on. I don't remember what they all were, but I remember uh, as they were going through it, I, I would... <laughs> use their account to watch the videos afterwards and like, oh, this is really good. So God speaks to us in many ways. And, but the, I was trying to emphasize last week that we can hear his voice because I think so often we think that that isn't true anymore, that that was a thing of the past. But we can hear his voice. All right, but it is all of that. So today we're kind of talking um, about all of it. Okay. But the thing that I like about this story and Elijah is that if we look at the physical, here's something to note about, that God speaks in a still small voice in a tumultuous time. The, the mountains are booming. They're falling apart. Anybody seen Lord of the Rings? Remember when the, the mountains, the giants are fighting and they're throwing rocks and the mountains crumbling and falling apart and it's boom, boom, boom. If you have high def, it's like really 
blasting away. That's kind of like this image that I get. The, the mountains are crumbling, they're falling. There's an earthquake. All this devastation, this loud, chaotic stuff going on around. And then God speaks in a still, small voice. And Elijah hears it in his heart. And he goes out to the mouth of the cave and then God speaks to him. So what I want to say about that is if we look at the physical, we can be distracted from the spiritual, his voice in our hearts. When we are going through a tumultuous time, a difficult time, may we remember this word and remember to listen for the still small voice within us. Don't get distracted by what's going on around you, though it's difficult. There's a lot of things that create stress and anxiety and things like that, depression, whatever. But we can't look at the physical. We have to look to the spiritual. Remember what Jeremiah spoke to us a couple weeks ago, the spiritual. So we use our, wep our spiritual weapons of prayer, of fasting, of praying, and, and attack those things that way to change the physical, the kingdom of heaven to earth. All right, so back to the point of getting hung up on a booming audible voice when God is speaking to his people in scripture. We ask the question, what if he still speaks to people the same? Think about Hebrews 11. Just the mention of that reference has already probably brought to your mind the title of that chapter, right? What is the name of a title that we call it? The faith chapter or the hall of faith, right? Not fame, but faith, it's a play on those words because in there we have a record of a bunch of people that God says these were people that walked by faith. What's interesting about that is that there were some people, well, all of them had to act on their faith, right? Some of them heard God audibly speak to them, but, and what about the others? What if it was just a thought or an impression or a feeling in their heart? What about Moses? He saw a burning bush and he asked, what's your name? What about Gideon, probably the poster hero for most of us seeking God's direction in a specific area of our life? What is he known for? Putting out fleeces. Some of us would throw fleeces out all over the place. right? <laughs> God, if it's really you... <laughs> Judges 6.17, so Gideon said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. <laughs> God, if it's really you. And by the way, just because we lay out a fleece doesn't mean God has to answer in that capacity that we're asking of him, does it? But I think God will honor a heart that is seeking him and he will make clear matters that we seek to him and direction and things of that nature. So if the accounts of Hebrew 11 were so clearly God, why would we call it the faith chapter? I mean, if God showed up today and spoke to you audibly, if Jesus came back to earth and he spoke to us audibly, we knew it was him, would you doubt what he tells you? None of us would. But yet he speaks to us, and sometimes we wonder, is this me, or is this God? Is it something I ate? Is it you know, something that this conversation I had over here, right? This is what we're talking about, learning to hear and recognize God's voice. Right? Last week, my sheep hear my voice, they know my voice, and they follow me. I like this, what Robert Morris has to say about this too. They had to believe that it was God speaking to them, speaking of these people in Hebrews 11. I submit to you that many people that heard God in the Bible might have heard God the same way we hear him in their hearts. And that's why they had to move by faith. All right, so God doesn't speak to us like robots. He speaks to us as humans. And here's point number three. God speaks to us as friends. Exodus 33, 11. Thus the Lord said to speak to Moses are used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his what? His friend. 
James 2.23 says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the what? Friend of God. So as we're going through this series, we're learning not only about how to hear from God, but the reason why we want to hear his voice is because he wants to be our friend. <laughs> Have we hit that home today <laughs> enough? He wants to be our friend. He could have created us like robots, but he's given us the free will with the ability to speak and to hear and to choose to love him. I always think when I think of love and the Father, I remember that verse, he demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And all the scriptures in the New Testament, they say something similar to this, that we demonstrate our love for him by keeping his commandments, by following his voice, by following his leading. You know, there was one couple that was left off that list of names before, and it was Adam and Eve. What did God do with them? before the fall. He walked with them in the cool of the day. He conversed with them face to face. That's what he did with them before the fall. And that's what he runs to restore with you and I, speaking to us. The Lord wants to have conversation with us. Some of my greatest moments in life have been when I've heard his voice Uh, just this week, Friday, uh, my sister Tasha came over here for something. Um, and she saw I was here, stopped in the office. And uh, she shared with me something that the Lord spoke to her. And I really don't want to share it because it's her story to tell. And I, don't, I won't get all the details of it right. But I will say... From a 30,000 foot view, I hope that she'll come back and share it with us. But she was worried about things that were going on in their life, all the busyness of things that were happening, and she was feeling overwhelmed. And there was one particular thing that, that she was struggling with uh, because they had to go different places and she forgot about something. And she heard the Lord say, I will preserve this. And, and so then in the end, she came back to something like, a couple days later that uh, the details of it, I, I guess, should never have happened, but everything was still fine. <laughs> but what was interesting about that is that same morning, I was in the office. Uh, just spending time with the Lord before I got started on work. And I, too, was wrestling with so much that needs to get done and uh, just feeling overwhelmed like how like desperate God I need you and he's had me in that place for a while not the overwhelmed feeling but the sense of desperately wanting more of him I want to hear his voice because I know when he speaks it's something monumental in my life and so I was just sitting there praying, and I heard him say, I will take care of this. Similar thing that was spoken to Tasha. And so what I want to share with you is that God wants to speak to you. I remember telling the story about my hip, right, and, and specifically recounting that time that we were in the back corner over there praying for John before he went in for his surgery. And Pastor Gary says, is there anyone else who wants prayer for anything? And I said what I had been saying for a while that yeah, I'd like prayer for my hips. I've been told that I, I need hip replacement in both hips. There's no cartilage left in there. It's, sometimes it's really painful. Other times, I think by God's grace, I can move around. <laughs> um, but I heard him speak to me. When I was not thinking about it. I wasn't praying about it. I was listening to preaching on the radio. I was waiting for Carly or Olivia in the store. And I heard him say, you will not need surgery. Just as clear as could be. And I knew that it was him. And the way that I received it was that I wasn't going to need surgery. I told 
I've shared this before, so I know this is, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, this is a good analogy. I, I shared it with someone who has walked through these kinds of things before, and he said, the reason the Lord gives you a word like that is because you're going to have to go through some things that are going to feel like it's not going to happen. And he's going to remind you of that word that he's spoken over you. And so, okay, I find that as time had gone on, this has been, month, this has been like a year or more now, because Olivia was in high school at the time. She's in college a year. She's in her, going in her second year. So that's how long it's been. And there have been times where I've been like, I don't know. <laughs> and in fact, I started telling that story and saying, God said I won't need surgery. I don't know what that means. That could mean a million different things. It could mean he's coming back soon. It could mean he's going to take me home soon. It could mean probably some other things I couldn't think of. But I stopped thinking about the word the way I received it, it that I, was, I wouldn't need surgery or that I was going to be healed. So I said that again back there. I don't know what this means. Could mean this, could mean that, could mean that. So Pastor Gary, all right, we, Joel's got a word from the Lord, doesn't know what it means, but we're going to pray for healing. I came back to my seat, and just as clearly as I heard the word that day outside of Kroger, I heard him say, why do you do that? And like a little kid that gets <laughs> chastised by his parents, I thought, uh, do what? I knew exactly what he was talking about. He said, why he said, how did you receive that word when I gave it to you? I said that you were going to heal me. He said, so stop saying all that other nonsense. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I'm telling you that was a conversation in my spirit that was more than just an impression. It wasn't an audible voice. I'm not saying that. But it was a voice that I knew was the Lord's. And it was a dialogue. And I felt the correction in that, and I have not spoken that word like that ever since then. I'm thanking him for my healing. It maybe hasn't manifested itself yet in the physical, but I know there's a reason and a timing for it all, and so I'm trusting and believing in him in that. I've stopped taking all the shots, the, the, the shots that are supposed to help you with the uh, inflammation, to help with the pain, because I'm like, I'm not doing that anymore, because I know the Lord's going to heal me. And I've said it enough now with conviction that when it happens, it's going to be a witness to all of us that the Lord still moves and acts and still speaks that way. But regardless of whether it happens now or some other time, he still speaks to us. We still hear his voice. Will you be God's friend? That's what he wants. God wants to be your friend. Otherwise, we'll only try to communicate with God when we're in trouble or when we have a big decision to make. God will communicate to us in those moments, but he wants to help us as a man speaks to his friend. He wants to be our friend. He wants to talk to us every day. God wanted to be our friend before we wanted to be his. There's a quote that I found uh, by Oswald Chambers that I think underscores all of this. The most important aspect of Christianity is not the work we do, but the relationship we maintain with God and the surrounding influence and qualities produced by that relationship. Look, we can't do the things that God is calling us to do on our own. We can't change our behavior. We can't become a better person, you know, all those things without, we can do it to a degree, but not to the degree to which we need to, to impact and change the world. And that can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit within us. So we have to maintain that relationship with him, which is why he's had us going back to that Shema, to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of our failures are included in that. Even the mistakes that we make, even when we give somebody a gesture out of our own frustration and our flesh, God can work through all of that. 
but it's only his spirit that transforms our hearts and lives. I, I'll never forget Jeremiah talking about James. We always heard about that book being a doing book. And he said, it's not a doing book, it's a being book. And I wrestled with that for a while until I realized it's a being book because it's who we are. Once he comes and has preeminence in our life, once we embrace him and we pursue him with everything we have, just the byproduct of being in his presence does a transformative work that changes us to, into a person that we could never become on our own. And that is what the world needs now more than anything. Not lip service, not... He needs us to be in the presence of the king and to rule from that place here on earth and to love people where they're at doesn't matter if they're woke or all that other stuff. We love them the way Jesus loves them and allow his presence in us to be a shining light to influence, to reach out into them. Every head bow, every eye closed. Oh, I finish, I'll finish that. That is all God's, God asks us to give our attention to, to maintaining that relationship with him. And it is the one thing that is continually under attack. What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you through this message this morning? I'll give you a few moments to allow the Spirit to speak. Father, we're not trying to, to produce anything. Lord, we just want to be in your presence. And Father, we know that you still move and speak and talk to us today, God. And so Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would do that now in each of us, God. I pray that as we go throughout this week, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us, Father. I pray that you would open our ears, God. For some of us, Father, it might mean getting alone in a physical closet <laughs> and just listening for your voice. I'm reminded of the, of the pattern we talked about last week. to put on worship, praise and worship. Start with adoration of the Father and magnifying his name. Move into a time of thankfulness for all that he's done, for all the ways that he's shown himself faithful. Open up his word and allow him to highlight things to you as you read just ask God to speak to you and he will may we all do our part look we are the body of Christ there's not any one of us here that are more important than the other but we all need to be pursuing him with everything that we have to be the best version of the body of Christ that Bedford United Church of the Nazarene can be. There's meaning behind that word united because we seek him with everything that we have. And so Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit, God. I just ask you to seal these things, Lord, by the blood of the Lamb and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If there's any here today that need prayer for anything, you would like prayer, I ask you to reach out to somebody here. 
Uh, we do have a board meeting I just reminded of. I don't know if that was mentioned in the announcements, but we do have a board meeting. But we want to take the time to pray with you if you need prayer. So, Father, again, we just thank you, Lord, and ask you to seal these things in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, all God's friends said, 